Romans chapter 7, if you haven't turned there already in your Bibles, I'm going to open up with uh, one verse, and then we're going to kind of unpack the rest of chapter 7. But I want to draw your attention, please, to Romans 7, verse 4. And Paul says this in Romans 7, verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become, underline this, dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him, that's meaning Jesus, who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Bless you. I think I felt that up here. That was, that was loud. Now, um, I'm a mess. You know how to pray for me now. So... Um, so Romans 7, 4, Paul says you're dead to the law. Now listen, if you're here last week, you might remember me saying this, Romans chapters 1 through 5 are all a positional. It's about our position in Christ, who we are in Christ. That's Romans 1 through 5. Romans 6 through 8, the section we're in now, are practical. And Romans 6 through 8, Paul emphasizes how to live out your life for Christ in practical ways. So first five chapters, positional, who we are in Christ. Chapters 6, 7, and 8, practical, how we are to live our lives for Christ. And one of the things he's going to address here in this seventh chapter is what place does the law of God, what place does the, do the commandments have in the life of the believer Today, After all, he says here in verse 4, what I just read, that we are dead to the law. We're dead to the law now that we are in Christ. Now listen, all that Paul means by that when he says we're dead to the law, all that he means is that the, there is no longer the dominion of the law over us in terms of justifying us before God. Let me say it a different way. Obeying the law does not make us right with God. The only way we are justified is through faith in Jesus Christ. And so in that sense, we're no longer married to the law. We're married to Christ. So here's what Paul anticipates then when he makes that point that people are going to say, well, then great, I'm married to Christ. We're under grace. The dominion of the law is no longer over me in terms of justification. So therefore, Paul anticipates this question, maybe the law is bad. Is it bad? Maybe the law is bad, Paul. Maybe we don't even need the law anymore. Maybe the commandments of God are out of date. They don't apply. We should just unhitch our lives from the Old Testament in general. And, and this is why Paul anticipates this. So he's going to address this in chapter 7. Here's the question. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? In other words, is the law bad? Maybe we don't need it anymore. And he answers it. He says, certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. In other words, he says, when, when the commandment of God highlighted sin in my life, it, 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 it put such a spotlight on sin that it's like sin revived. He goes, because I, I wasn't even aware of a lot of sin until the law spoke to it. So verse 10, he says, and the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death because it convicted me for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it killed me. Therefore, verse 12, therefore, he says, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Now, underline those words, because he's, he's saying the law and the commandments of God. Now, by the way, we're not just talking about the Ten Commandments. That's what people naturally think of when you hear the commandments of God, the law of God. We're not talking just the Ten Commandments. In the Old Testament, there are over 600 commandments in terms of statutes or ordinances or laws of God. 
Now, by the way, we're no longer bound to the dietary aspect of the law. Jesus made that clear. He, he, he talks about it's not what goes in a man that makes a man unclean, but it's what comes out of a man. It's the issues of the heart. So we're no longer bound to the dietary aspects of the law, but the moral code of God is still intact. And people are going to naturally wonder, as they did in Paul's day, well, if we're under grace now, maybe we don't even need any of the law. And Paul comes along and goes, no, the law of God is good and holy and just. And he's going to give us three reasons here in chapter 7 why the law of God is still important. And for you note takers, here's the first reason. He says, because it explains what sin is. That's verse 7 again in your Bibles. It's the latter part of verse 7. He says, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness, he, he says as an example, unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Now, that happens to be one of the Ten Commandments. It's commandment number 10. You shall not covet. A co covetousness is the desire, the envious desire of something that doesn't belong to you. And it's, it shows a lack of contentment with what God has given you. You always want what everybody else has, and you're not satisfied. Now, look, Paul says here, there are some things that I wasn't aware of until I actually read it in the law. Look, there are many things, most things, in fact, I think it's safe to say, that you and I will have an understanding of what is right and wrong. And the reason is because we've all been created in the image and likeness of God. And having that moral capacity to understand what God has given us, we call it a God conscience. That's why we can know without having to read a list of some basic things that are right and wrong. Example, you don't need to be a Christian. You don't have to ever step foot in a church to instinctively know that murder is wrong. Am I right? And if you don't realize murder is wrong, you're called a sociopath, ladies and gentlemen, okay? It's a diagnosed thing, okay? But most people who are not sociopaths, most people realize, hey, murder's wrong. You don't have to read that in the Bible. Nobody had to tell you that. Why did you know that? Because of your God conscience that God has given you. But Paul says here, but there are some things, there are some things that are not as clear to my God conscience that I'm not aware of unless I could read it spelled out in the law. And for Paul, he said one of those things was covetousness. He said, I didn't even really know I was sinning against God until I read, do not covet. Yeah, he's, I can imagine Paul saying, you know, I have, I have to be honest, like there were times I'd stand outside of, you know, a retail store and I would envy somebody's chariot parked out front. <laughs> You know, and I'm like, wow, look, look at the horses attached to that chariot. That's great horsepower that chariot has. And I wish I had that chariot. I wish I could drive that chariot that that person has. I envy that. That's covetousness. Or maybe, you know, maybe Paul stepped into, you know, a Roman retail store like hobbyist lobbyist. And uh, that's a little nod to the Green family who happens to be here today, Steve and Jackie Green and their family. Steve's the president of Hobby Lobby. My, my wife loves to support your family, Steve. <laughs> and maybe Paul would drift into a retail store and he'd look at everything there and think, I wish this was all mine. I wish I had all this. And Paul says, I, I didn't even realize that I was envying and that that was sin until I read it spelled out in the law. There are just some things that might escape our God-given conscience until we actually see it in God's Word. You, you, let me give you another example. The idea of forgiveness. Forgiveness does not come naturally to us. When somebody has wronged you or betrayed you, the natural instinct is get even, revenge, hold a grudge. But God calls His people to forgive. That's not legalism. This isn't even in, this is in the New Testament. Colossians 3.13, forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as Christ has forgiven you. And so we're called to forgive. Why? Because God wants us to be free. And you say, well, that's not easy. No, it's not. But it's what God calls us to. And I may not be aware of that in myself until I read it spelled out in God's Word. You know, sometimes you, you see these people, and I say this with compassion, not judgment. 
You see sometimes these family members get up in court and they offer these victim impact statements when a convicted criminal is about to be sentenced. And sometimes they will say things like, turning to the criminal saying, I'll never forgive you and I hope you rot in hell. And I've never walked in their shoes. Again, I'm not judging. I, I hear their pain. But the fact of the matter is that if they don't forgive, they're just as much as in prison as the criminal just a different kind. And God wants us to be free. And see, the only way we can really be free from hurt and pain and betrayal is to forgive as Christ has forgiven me. That's a tall order. That's what he calls us to because he wants what's best for us. And what's best for us is that that person who's betrayed us no longer has power over us. And the way that you get rid of that is when you forgive. Now listen to the etymology of that word. Forward, you're just forward giving them to God. He's like, God, you're going to have to deal with this person because I don't want what they've done to keep me bound in a prison of bitterness for the rest of my life. So, Lord, I forgive. I forgive as you have forgiven me. And, Lord, you deal with that person. I forward give them to you. There's a lot of things in the Bible that are not always that easy. Some things I read in the Bible go down like ice cream. Other things go down like Brussels sprouts. I got to be honest with you. It's like, ah, oh, man, I, this is good for me, but I don't, I'm not sure I like the taste of this. And nevertheless, God calls us to do that. And sometimes the only way we know what sin is, is how it is defined in the Bible and helping us to realize, oh, this is right and this is wrong because our God conscience doesn't always help us to see all that. Number two, for you note takers, the other thing Paul says here is that the law is important because it exposes sin in us. It not only defines and explains what sin is, but it exposes sin in us. Now, I'm going to read verses 15 to 23, but I'm actually going to read it from the, the ESV because I, I, I normally teach here from the New King James, but it was a little wordy and I didn't feel it was uh, as easily understood as the ESV. So, I'm going to step aside and throw the verses up on the screen. Verse 15, I do not understand my own actions, Paul says, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Can anybody relate to that sometimes? Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want, but, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members, in other words, in my body, in my physical members, another law, and then I underline this, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So I'm going to put the second point back up there, and let me explain here what he's talking about, because in order to really understand this, this battle, notice again he talks about a war within we have to understand how God has made us and what happens at the time of salvation. So here's how God has made every human being. We are three parts in one individual. We are all body, soul, and spirit. The soul is basically the real essence of an individual. It is your, it's the seat of your mind, will, and emotions. It is your ability to think reason, it is the intellectual and feeling and believing part of an individual. And your soul is linked eternally with your spirit. Sometimes in the Bible, soul and spirit are actually used interchangeably. That's how much it, they are both connected. But your soul is connected with your spirit. Your spirit is the immaterial you. It's the non-physical you. It is the part that survives after death. Your soul and your spirit are linked together and they are eternal together. The question is, 
where will you spend eternity? Where will your spirit and soul together spend eternity, either in hell or in heaven? There's no other choice. Your spirit is housed within a body of flesh. Your body is not eternal. There is a day appointed each of us will die. Our body will decay and return to dust from which it was created. Now, the Bible says for believers, we get a glorified body like Christ, but that's for another Bible study. For the meantime, just understand the soul, the seat of the mind, will, and emotions, the intellectual feeling, believing capacity. It's the real essence of who you are. That's why your soul and your spirit intertwined together outlives your body of flesh. That's the real you. And what happens when a person is not saved is that there's no war. The war that Paul's talking about, I just read, happens after you get saved. Before you get saved, before you come to a relationship with Christ, there's no conflict between body, soul, and spirit. You just do what you want to do. There's not a battle there. You're living the, the Chick-fil-A fest. My pleasure. <laughs> You're just living, everything's about my pleasure. I love Chick-fil-A, but I wish they'd stop saying that every time you say thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure. Okay, I get it, my pleasure. <laughs> so before you get saved, that's the way it is. You're just living for my pleasure. There's no internal conflict. Now, you get saved, you turn your life over to Christ, guess what? Your spirit is regenerated within your body that is not regenerated. And so your spirit wants to please the Lord and your body still gravitates to ungodly appetites. And therein is the conflict. There's a war going on. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the heart of a dog trapped in the body of a cat. <laughs> Be like that, okay? Like, like, so the cat part of you is like evil, <laughs> right? Wicked, dark, and the cat part of you is just, ah, ah. you know, the cat part of you struts around like you own the place and you won't listen to nobody, okay? <laughs> That's the cat part of you. Am I right? That's a cat. Like, you talking to me? I don't think so. Okay? By the way, we, we were in Egypt uh, last month. And we were in the Valley of the Kings and where they have all these tombs. And this one Egyptian guy who was part of the digs that were going on there, he calls me over and he's got, he's got his cell phone out. He goes, I want you to show you some things we found here. I'm like, what, what are you going to show me? In one tomb, they found 80 mummified cats. 80 mummified cats, because the ancient Egyptians like had a thing about cats. And I, I'm looking and I'm scrolling through these mummified cats. And I thought to myself, I finally found a cat I like. I'm going to get some emails this week. Might as well. Might as well. Anyway, the idea is there's a conflict at war because, you know, the cat side of you is like dark and evil, but, but the dog side of you loves Jesus. The dog side of you is loyal, like friendly, happy. Um, obedient to the master, right? <laughs> Obeys the commands of the master. But, but there's this conflict that's constantly going on. And, and so when I read the law, you see, when I read God's word and I hold my life up to the perfect standard of God, God's word fillets me right, wide open. Can any of you relate to this? Like you'll be reading your Bibles and, and you're thinking nothing about any particular sin issue in your life because you may not even be aware of it. And then you read a story or a verse or passage and then the Holy Spirit convicts you because the Word of God exposes that sin in your life and you realize, oh yeah, that is, that is something I, I wrestle with. God, forgive me. We need the law of God because it exposes that in us that otherwise might go unnoticed. Remember Psalm 19, seven to eight, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. This is God's word. That's why we need it. Don't unhitch yourselves from the Old Testament. We need God's moral code. Lastly, number three, and then we're going to share communion together. Number three, it expresses our need for a Savior. 
Two verses here. Look again in your Bibles at verses 24 and 25. Paul writes, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he answers, he gives praise to God. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I want you to note this, underline in your Bibles that one question he asks there, who will deliver me from this body of death? The people in the first century would have understood better what Paul meant there than we do today. So let me bring context. There was an ancient Roman practice. I say ancient from our perspective. It was current and modern in Paul's day. In fact, the uh, Roman poet Virgil writes about this. Virgil lived, I, I think, like in the first century BC, but it was, it was practiced then, and Virgil even wrote about this. And, and here's the way that Romans would sometimes punish murderers. You ready for this? They would sometimes punish murderers by taking the murdered body, the dead corpse of the one you murdered, and chaining the dead corpse to the back of the murderer. And then you would have to lug around this rotting, decaying corpse until what would happen is the disease of the rotting, decaying corpse would transfer onto you and kill you. That's the language Paul is using here. He says, my sin nature is like I'm dragging around this rotting, decaying corpse that is killing me. I need to be free from this. I'm in this battle, Lord, of wanting to please you, but I see the pull of my flesh with his ungodly desires in conflict with your spirit. And he says, who will rescue me from this decaying corpse? And he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. He says, Jesus is my savior. Jesus is gonna help me if I lean into him and if I ask him to help me. Now, here's, here's what Jesus did. Remember, in John 16, 17, before Jesus departs, he promises the Holy Spirit to be with us. Here's what's interesting. In Romans 6, 7, and 8, the section we're looking at, the Spirit is not mentioned one time in chapter 6. The Spirit is mentioned one time in chapter 7 and the Spirit is mentioned 21 times in chapter eight, because that's where we go from here. He says the help in Christ is because he's given us of his Spirit, and his Spirit, the presence of God, will help us to live a life that is honorable to the Lord, fighting the sin battle, until we get to him one day and we no longer have this body of flesh, and we can be with him forever. So chapter eight is to come, but for today, we're gonna stop here and have communion together. So would you pray with me? Ushers, would you come? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that Paul writes so honestly and vulnerably. He echoes the story of all of us. We want to please you but there's a battle and we often fail miserably. Who will rescue us from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus, you gave your life on a cross to set us free from sin and death, to forgive us so that we can be made new in our spirit. And until the day that we leave this body of flesh, we need your help and your strength, your power, your grace. We need your Holy Spirit. And so today, Lord, it's a good day for us to remember your sacrifice on the cross, the price that you paid to secure liberty for us, forgiveness, a new life, and we thank you, Jesus, for loving us so much that you would give your life on a cross. Pray now as we are about to partake of the elements that we would
think of you and worship you, remember you and what you did for us by dying for our sins. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.